the, the, the okay. housekeeping done. We are now um, recording. All right, and and you've started recording. So, uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18, this meeting of the Transportation Advisory Committee is being conducted by a remote participation. This meeting is being recorded to the web and could be shown on Amherst Media and broadcast on the town Amherst YouTube channel. Anybody dialing in by phone can press star nine to raise their hand to be recognized. People with video link can click the raise hand button at the corner of the screen. Otherwise, I'm just gonna you know, do the thing, look for your hands as you're moving around or as you're yelling at the screen. Um, all right. So, hello everybody. Um, I'm, I'm gonna get the agenda up here. That's the other thing about having another screen is you can have lots of room for things. Sure, um, I just joined and I promoted him to a panelist. So he is oh. in our meeting now. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for keeping track of that. Um, the, I don't have many announcements, I, I have one. Um, I wanna say that the, um, the letter that I sent to the DOT um, was very well received. I was surprised, first of all, at the prompt response. Uh, and then second of all, that um, um, it, got, it got passed around. It got, I, was, I was told that it was forwarded to other people. Um, so um, they, they did appreciate it in the end, which is maybe less of a surprise nowadays because the DOT is getting better about you know, catching up with what what um, its customers really want. Um, I don't know. Is there anything? Oh, I guess um, no. I'll save another announcement for when we do next meetings. Um, I'll not be able to come to the next meeting, so I volunteered Kim to uh, to take over. But I'll announce that when we get to schedule. Um, public comment. Um, I see some public. Hi, George. Um, Hi, Eve. <laughs> and um, and um, so, um, so so Guilford was worried that um, this was going to be too much work for our our time tonight. Um, but here we are in number four already. Um, so I was wondering uh, uh, what it is is a parking guideline recommendations update. So last time, um, we we took a look at at the um, the memo that Guilford put together for um, Paul um, and liked it a lot and offered some some tweaks and some ideas that would make it even better. I guess the big one being that um, the completeness of the street would help determine what you know what the parking should be. As, as part of it, I mean, it, it's and that that was something that was unspoken to directly in the in the original memo. So I'm wondering if there is an update on that. Yeah, so two things: one is it, it updates on that, and second, um, if if we want to do we the TAC want to do something um, maybe more more formal. Um, so so. Updates first. So the complete street part, I kind of left that out because in a sense, this is this is a part of complete streets. Complete streets isn't a part of this. So I can't, it doesn't really flow well to make complete streets part of this when it is part of, it right. doesn't flow well. No, I understand, okay. So, but I added in the other things you asked the, here, I'll, show, I'll just share it with you and we can cool. go over it one more time. Um, so here we are, um, I added the parking over here. Um, oh, I lost the bike lane thing. Yeah, and actually that's a good point. I mean, the the when we were working with with bike lanes and, and other elements, those are pieces 
terms of complete streets. So I, I'm understanding what you're saying about the flow. Yeah, actually, there was a column here that said parking. I mean, uh, not parking, but bike lanes. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> well, where it went to. Uh, that that was my um comment too. I just was muted. Yeah. Right. Oh. 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 oh Kim. <laughs> Okay. So that's the bike, I'll just call it bike lane for now. Um, and then that's pretty much all, of it. that's pretty much all of it, I think. Was there anything, there was some discussion about a couple other things, but they were kind of vague. Um. <clears throat> well, um, adding um, specifics on, on intersections, Yeah, actually, I must have saved this to a different spot. It's not showing up where I am um, on this one. That was added in. A minimum of 30 feet from the intersection was added into it. Um, is this a, what is this from? Is this a proposed document? A proposed document that was, that came out of discussions with some counselors about the fact there's really, um, no rules or guidelines for what, how we set parking or where we set parking. So this was sort of an attempt to kind of give some guidance on how we set parking. And then the issue, the one thing that can be left open to interpretation or for something we have to, to interpret it, interpret is um, uh, usage, which is uh, vehicle volumes which that's the only thing that's really not laid out very well in this, which we know we'll have to work on as we go along. I guess, can you hear me, Guilford? Can yes. You? Yes, go ahead, Kim. I guess one thing I was just wondering if you could just at least just maybe in the preface to the um, portion that with the table that you just showed us, um, you might just say something like, um, or, or wherever it fits more readily, something like in accordance with the cons complete streets policy or something, just so that it's in there. So then people can go back to that if they need to, you know, the counselors might be able to go back to that as, um, you know, something, just a simple, just get that word, the, that, that phrase in there. Yeah, exactly, as part of. Yes, yes, Eve, while he's doing that. I'm concerned about you guys um, designating widths of um, vehicle lane widths and bike lane widths during this process, because I actually think vehicle lane widths um, need a broader conversation. Um, and bike lane widths are going to depend in part on what we've set up with level of service, um, whether you need a buffer or not. So I'm just concerned about a document like this that's intended to inform parking, setting standards for other things that um, you're not considering as comprehensively at this time. That's a good point. Yeah. But although but perhaps this, is, this works the other way around, it's responding to what is on the street. Yes, Kim? No, I was just saying, but perhaps this could be a, a, a minimum guideline or something like that. So that it doesn't interfere with those kinds of things, Eve, what do you think? Well, I mean, in terms of lane width for um, motor vehicles, I think there's a lot of argument that the minimum should be less than this. You know, so I've given the example of when I talk to people in Eugene, Oregon, for example, and their arterials go down to 9.5 feet, including that buses travel on. And if you narrow the lane width, it's a good um, infrastructural way to slow traffic, right? So we, and we've talked about that a lot. So I know that Guilford doesn't agree with that, which is why I think that it actually is, needs a broader conversation. But um, that's why I, I'm uncomfortable saying that the minimum lane width is 10 feet. So if you really want to see a good example of a minimum lane width, which I think is nine and a half feet, you should drive on the new section of University Drive on campus. 
And when you do it, follow the buses that drive down the road and see how they drive in almost uh, yeah. half the score mark, the gore mark between the bike lane and the yeah. travel lane. Um, it's well, yeah, but this, this is, this doesn't, uh, this, so um, this sh document should not work, I think to Eve's point, should not work as setting those um, uh, dimensions. What, what should be uh, setting those dimensions is the complete streets policy that we have, or, or that and, um, uh, you know, good traffic engineering and, you know, the emergency services. Um, uh, and in, this, the in part of that um, ends up being what is layered on top of that when it's done. So, um, so Eve, uh, I mean, that, that, that's, that's and, and now I don't know how to make that clear. I mean, clearly when you read this, Eve, you didn't see it that way. You saw it as creating those, those requirements. And I imagined it um, working the other way as taking what's, what re those requirements are for those three types of streets and, you know, layering parking onto it. Sorry, I was just going to add that in terms of bike lanes also that um, our level of service, in addition to the complete streets policy, the uh, level of service um, matrix is trying to give um, recommended design standards. So, so I, would, I would agree with what Eve's saying, but the goal is, is to get something started. And if we go back later on and choose different ones, I mean, I'm not going to be here forever. <laughs> and probably about five, four or five years. It just years, feels maybe, like that. Yeah, maybe six years from my end date. I'm not going to fight fights as hard as I fight in, in the past. So, you know, you just, it, it's, this is just a starting point and then it can change as you go along. Um, I mean, to really think about where we're having problems with parking. Yeah. The big places with parking is in the neighborhoods where yeah. you're not, going to have a lot of room for having a designated bike lane unless you make the road one way or you take the bike lane and put it up on the by the sidewalk and make the sidewalk bigger mm -hmm. um, and the other place we're having issues with parking is pretty much along the main roads where you don't want parking anyhow uh, but people are parking in what the shoulder is used for bikes now right so Bruce and then Bernie yeah I, I was going to suggest that one possibility, uh, thinking about what Eve is saying, is you could say, based on the roadway classifications above, the following are the recommended lane widths, total pavement widths, and parking area widths in feet, comma, at the present time, meaning this might be open to change in the future. Yeah. So, so Bernie? Same thought. I was just going to say, put the term current yeah. in front of recommended. Now, now the, um, um, I'm, I'm going to recall that the complete streets policy doesn't, um, on, on neighborhood streets, does not, on um, local streets, does not require bike lanes specifically. It's a shared, the roadway becomes more of a shared resource rather than sections of it being divided off as, as one of the uh, one of the aspects. <clears throat> so those are the two options you were talking about, right? Yeah, I think either, either pick one. Either they, they both just let folks know that these are subject to change. I'm open and, to you. And local application. So could you just say that um, based on the roadway classifications above and the usual lane widths total, usual lane widths um, today, the parking area widths, the recommended parking area widths in feet are. So just so the recommendation is only about parking area widths since that's the main thing you're really focusing on here. Well, that's not the, the whole, the main, the main thing is to decide which roads are wide enough to have parking on. 
So you have to kind of have what your travel lanes are. I guess I'm, I'm concerned too, because this whole, you know, the level of traffic stress system that we've been creating, right? It defines um, local, like it, it depends not only if a road is designated local, but we're putting in other variables like um, visibility, speed of traffic, um, and what's the other one? Well, just sort of the amount of traffic and that that would, that would determine what kind of um, bike and walking facilities you would have. So um, anyway, so this actually actively potentially contradicts what we're putting together in that system. <clears throat> yeah, and, and so I'm, I'm wondering if if the um, the so order, the hierarchy might be out of out of order because really this is this is not setting lane widths. This is um, uh, um, really it's it's whatever the lane width needs wants to be in that road. However, that's determined. The parking has to be uh, compliant with that. Parking can't impose on that. So the uh, so, so uh, following the, they're not they're not recommended lane widths. They are um, uh, actual lane widths. So again, you know, this is not recommending lane widths. This this document is not recommending lane widths. It is recommending that uh, parking be allowed when the lane width is maintained or can be maintained. <clears throat> so the other way around this is that this that just stays a, a memo from the DPW addressing <laughs> a concern from a counselor, and then a second thing come from the transportation advisory committee saying, yeah, this is a good start, but we think in, as we move forward, these things need to be addressed as well, but we haven't addressed those things yet. Yeah, I think. Well, yeah, this, well, this, this is baseline. This is what, what is now. And it, you know, it addresses an immediate situation. It's going to be sub it's going to be subject to, to refinement and change, and I think that um, if people understand that, then that's that's fine. And I guess the purpose of this, right, is just to, I mean, there's one a, a couple immediate concerns that that need to be addressed like now. <laughs> so right, um, and that's what they're asking for. Um, so so we can come back and say yes. This is the minimum, but here is his our vision for Amherst transportation network, you know, in the future, and how we can begin to comply with that at the moment, which is you know all of these extra um, things that they might not be thinking about right now. So, so, so if we yeah. I I agree. We should come back with we should come back with 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 updates these to this to this document. So so perhaps um, you could send this and then and and to us as well. And then this is something that we build on with with the counselors in the future. Once we have our network, you know, public. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because the counselors are going to talk this thing through as well and take yeah. input and mm -hmm. so yeah. um, so so I guess um, I, I like that Kim as a, as a way of uh, I'll get to you Tracy <laughs> as a way of um, of you know moving on um, is that we the TAC might draft a response to this yeah uh, so I appreciate and 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 and. and Part of that response is saying that we're going to appreciate the changes, the tweaks that have been made to it, because I'm, I'm 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 taking for granted that the the red marks here and the additional column that that's going to go that's going to remain part or become part of Guilford's communication to 
Paul on the and the council, <clears throat> and then we can respond to that directly by adding all of these things. And and really, in a way, it's um, I guess our response is saying, oh, by the way, in order for complete streets to work with this, then we this is what the other considerations that we have to that that need to be added to it. And I guess um, yeah. So you guess yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I mean, as soon as we get our policies in order, then we can begin to apply them to things such as this, you know, documents such as, you know, our right. reply to the counselors with this, yep. with our information or added information or added policies. So, yeah. And I guess that's kind of what Guilford is suggesting. Okay. Is that what we, is that what, we, oh, Tracy, I'm sorry. I, I, no, I mean, I think I agree with what's been said. Um, and I don't know too, George Ryan is here as a member of the TSO and the person, the counselor who had originally brought the, you know, his concerns to TSO. So I don't know if he wants to speak in a minute. Um, I think it's great to have this as a baseline. I, I mean, one of the issues that's come up with Lincoln and Sunset is also, and, I mean, there's other questions besides, is there the capacity on the street for there to be parking? Like, for example, right, people are thinking, or at least, you know, some of the discussions of the TSO has been like, well, could we allow parking during these hours and not these hours, you know, can, so there's other considerations too, beyond whether yes, parking's allowed, no, parking's not allowed. Um, and I, so, I mean, that's something I think that the TSO would have to consider about like how it wants to, I mean, there could be you know, just as has been proposed for parts of Lincoln to allow parking, you know, overnight, but not parking during the day or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, and I think, I mean, so I think this is really a good like first take. The, yeah. the other thing I keep thinking about in addition to the complete streets idea is also just about, I, I would think that there could be cases where you wouldn't want on street parking, like maybe based on adjacent land uses or things like that. Um, so again, this is like a really good first cut as a general policy. Yeah. Um, but then of course it would be refined as has been discussed. So yeah, so, uh, yeah and that, that, that's interesting uh, about the, you know, you know the, the nearby land use. Um, I would, I'm going to, suggest that um, the time of day parking and whether it should be, you know, neighborhood permit and all that other stuff, that that is best left to somebody besides the transportation advisory committee, sure. like let's say the TSO, um, because it's not a technical issue. It really is a policy issue. Um, you're right, you're absolutely right. Those are decisions that need to be taken. Right. And, and um, but I, I'm thinking that's out, out of what I imagine our purview is. Yeah, so I think George wants to speak. Yeah, I see George's hand go up. Yes, George. Hi, George. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm listening, really. I, I, I'm, I'm really speaking. I'm really <laughs> it's okay. Speaking just, no, I know, just to listen. Um, but I, I did want to confirm, if I could, that I believe, Guilford, you are going to come and speak to TSO about parking. Is that correct? Is that the next TSO meeting, is my understanding? Um, um, I... I'm not trying to create work for you, Guilford. I'm just asking. It may, it may be the answer is you don't know, and that's fine. Or maybe the answer is you've never heard this uh, request. <laughs> but my chair, I believe, and she's not here today, unfortunately, but I believe she had told us at the last meeting that you are going to um, be present at a TSO meeting to talk about this uh, issue. Does that ring any bells or no? It does, but... Um... I don't have it down for the next your next meeting. Okay. Um, All right. That's fine. Not, it's your might, schedule, right? Okay. Well, I might not have just written it down on my calendar. Well, I will. I will check with our chair. And but I guess my point to Tack is just that um, we are looking forward to that conversation and and to that presentation. And then we will. Um, so that's really why um, I just wanted to bring that up. But we're we're going to have. I think at some point soon, but maybe not next meeting, but soon, uh, a similar discussion with Guilford uh, I, about the memo and about parking regulations in general. Because um, as, as we said, this got started by request from TSO and Guilford grabbed it and said, I think I can do something with this. And he has, which is great. 
And so I think when he comes back to speak to us, um, that will be very helpful to TSO. And um, I really appreciate what you all are doing and your contributions. So I'm gonna shut up and just listen. Um, I will be bowing out after the parking, but um, I appreciate very much what you're doing and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you, thank you indeed. Um, all right, so um, I had not planned for us to begin to put together a response to so, you know, this, this new idea to put to respond to this um, for tonight. Um, but but I thought <clears throat> we're going to get give a response only after we have come up with our own set of policies. Yeah, exactly. And and so there's a lot of work that we have to do to get to that. I mean, yeah, we, there's sure. a, but, a but, bunch but, of ideas that have floated in, and I had not planned on that for tonight. Um, I don't know if if we would want to to begin that now. Um, besides picking Bernie to draft it. Well, I mean, I think we could wait. We're like still working on our bike ped map. And I mean, we do yeah. want to have like the network. And so in that context, I think we could wait on it. And it does seem like there's some other important yeah. items for tonight. Also, I mean, because it will go to the TSO next week, It'd be useful to hear what the TSO members think of what Guilford's proposing as well. And yes, we can respond to you. that as well. Yeah, and, and I, I, I th thank you, Tracy, for for saying that. I, that's, I, I guess you read the, my email back to you about whether or not to schedule time for the uh, subcommittee tonight, because yeah. I, I, I thought it was good too too chock a block full to, to give that enough good time. Um, all right, so we'll, I'll put that onto the work plan, and we'll 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 pick up a uh, pick that up. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So thank you, thank uh, you, Gil Ferd. Somebody's got their hand up. Bernie. No, I don't have a hand up. I just. I, I just <laughs> oh, with, it's my it's my I'm hand. That's my cursor. Yeah, think, it looks like a I, hand. I, I, I'm agreeing with Tracy. I think we've got um, plenty of stuff to do now and. Yeah, in, good. in the near future. So, all right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Guilford, for that. All right. Um, major intersection decision considerations. So the the uh, the main event for tonight, I had hoped, would be uh, to begin to put together our um, ideas on um, how to make the decision. Um, what we might suggest as a way to make it to, to get to the decision of whether um, intersections in general, but Pomeroy Village Center project in particular um, is a roundabout or um, a signalized intersection. Um, and um, <clears throat> Tracy. Oh, just in terms of that vein, I'm sure you're going to talk about this, but I know that there is right the public forum for Pomeroy next Thursday as part of the TSO meeting, and then also on Saturday, two days later, which is going to be a two-hour session. The TSO forum is only a one-hour session, yeah. so I just wanted to check about what's our time frame in terms of our do is it our intention to weigh in and provide some feedback prior to the forums or after the forums? Well, I, I was hopeful that um, our discussion tonight got a far enough along that we had something to offer the TSO at their next meeting next week. Um, and, and and what what I'm imagining, and I'm certainly, we can change our mind about this. What I'm imagining is that rather than saying, that's the intersection we want, although I think it's clear what that would be, that we outline how to get to that decision, maybe in a way that makes it obvious as to what our decision would be. Uh, so, you know, when you consider a roundabout, here are the pros and cons. When you consider a signalized section, here are the pros and cons and, and compare them to each other. Um, and that, that's, that's what I'd hope to be. I'd hope to bring some fairly advanced form of that um, yeah, I think none of the things. The um, public comment to the meeting next week. Yeah, sorry, Tracy. I think. Oh, Go ahead. Marcus is speaking. Uh, no, I'm oh, sorry, Marcus. Tracy. Marcus. Yeah. 
Um, one of the things we need to address is uh, are blind pedestrians, because that seems to be the big hoo-ha down in that part of town. I, I would be interested to see how many blind pedestrians we actually have in that part of town to see, you know, so we can at least triage the situation. Sorry, my um, uh, four-year-old is playing in the background. Uh, but uh, verse it, and then also understand how many uh, oral alarm, orally alarmed uh, road crossings we have in the town in general. Because, I mean, so, it's all very yeah. well bringing this up as like, oh, we need to take into account this section of the population, but what is our existing situation today? Yeah. So what I imagine for this exercise is to, um, is that we would, um, first of all, identify the elements that would need to be considered in, in taking your decision about an intersection. Um, and, and we've identified them in our, in our chats and I just you know, wanted to get them down onto a list. And I, I don't know, um, if we do that on screen or just take uh, somebody take notes, uh, okay, Tracy. And so the elements that we've talked about, uh, we've talked about uh, crossing safety and efficiency. We've talked about um, environmental impacts. We've talked about um, 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 creating a sense of neighborhood. Can't or, hear you. I'm calling it a, can't hear me. <sighs> Oh man! No, it's not you, Aaron. It's not you. Yeah, I could. I could hear Aaron fine. That's oh, fine. That's fine. Sorry. Maybe, maybe you don't want to hear me, which is okay too. Yes, Guilford. Um, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say something that Amber wanted to say, but she, she had to leave. Oh. Um, uh, when we when she's going through the video, the recordings that pull the minutes off. Um, sometimes we get too wrapped up and talk too fast and talk over each other. So, so the, the computer's having a hard time dis distinguishing what's being said and who's saying what. So um, I guess what would be nice if we could all practice just being a little more uh, organized and when we speak and how we speak and making sure we keep everything in flow so we can get a better uh, recording because Amber was lost Way last too time. excitable. We are. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, th you th like th th thank you, Amber. That's good. Thank you, Amber. <laughs> so, Chris okay. oh, also like has to stand up officially. Uh oh, but, but she has to, you have to push the mute button. Yeah. I wanted to offer some clarity about when these comments are being asked for. So, I got an email from um, Darcy today regarding, um, I guess it was DAAC comments. So, she's asking, that comments be given to the TSO. Um, and they're gonna be considering this topic on April 8th and also on April 22nd. And then the town council will take up this topic on May 3rd. So that gives you a schedule that you can work with. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. No, th thank you, yeah. And and, and on, on top of that, there the, there's the two fora that uh, the Tracy mentioned. So in the next week, and then the, the following two hour session, um, which we haven't been invited to explore. Well, I, I sense we're always invited to come and chat about those things. Uh, so, um, uh, so the, but thank you, that, that's, that's, a, that's good. Cause um, we certainly don't want to uh, impede anything. Um, Tracy, is that, that's right, that's where we were, Tracy. Hi, um, so at the last meeting, um, you had suggested that maybe I put together like a few slides with some bullets related to this question about roundabouts and intersections. Oh, as a primer, um, yes. Indeed. And then also, um, well, and I have been thinking a lot about this both after the comments from the DAC about some of their concerns with the Triangle Street intersection. I um, mean, also because I've been taking this roundabout class and also reading a lot of studies about roundabouts. So, um, but I can, I can do that quickly if that's helpful. Would you, that, that would be, I think that would be good. I right, thank you. That's Tracy. Yeah. Now, now I'll say, um, I'll say that my first, I'm going to share my screen in a minute, but before I do so, I want to say that the, I mean, I feel like some of the, the, you know, the questions about the strengths of 
um, this of the different options and what the town wants to get out of them. That the town did such a great job presenting them at their presentation to the town council. And so instead of reinventing the wheel, I borrowed some of their slides without their permission, but I'm saying, I acknowledge well, that they're from them. The point so is well thank taken. you, Chris, and thank you, Guilford, and everything. <laughs> you guys have put a lot of work into it already. And I mean, I do think that it would be helpful for some of the attendees at the forum to maybe have some of these overviews, at least a few slides of it if they haven't seen it before. So I'll, I'll go ahead and share it. Uh, all right. So just um, from recapping what uh, Chris, you know, and Guilford and everybody had talked about at the intersection, again, these are the slides I brought from the, account, the staff's presentation. You know, when looking at that intersection, the deficiencies right now are the lack of pedestrian accessibility, the lack of sidewalks, you know, the issues with the signals, the no bike lanes and the queuing that happens at rush hour. Um, and, and here, here's a, another staff slide. And so, you know, it does seem, and and thinking about this intersection, it really does seem that both of these main alternatives, both the signalized intersection with enhancements, including a left-hand turn lane, as well as the roundabout, could address these issues. And so this is what's in the staff, the slide that the staff had put together, because like all of those elements are addressed um, with the enhanced signalized intersection, the left-hand turn lane would be a huge help, um, and also with the roundabout. Right, um, and this is just the last slide I had borrowed from the town presentation, just about like all these different issues. Some of these do involve the TAC, a number of them in terms of the bus piece, the bike ped piece, the ADA piece, the traffic volume, the safety. Those are all things that we're thinking about as members of the TAC. Um, and then here's just my like quick couple slides. So in terms of roundabouts, um, in terms of how, what roundabouts are designed to do, this is my one slide. Um, so right, so roundabouts are designed to slow the travel speeds down through the intersections and calm traffic. And they do that by having the angles entering the intersection, which are much the angles such that the, that the traffic has to slow down. Um, so when you have, you know, anything you read about roundabouts, when you have lower speed traffic, then you also will have lower speed crashes which will lead to less fatalities in general for motorists, bicyclists, and pedestrians, and less property damage. Um, and then also a lot of the roundabouts have medians and islands um, that can reduce the crossing distance for pedestrians, including people with mobility issues. Um, the roundabouts can reduce intersection queuing, such as at commuter hours, because the traffic is always moving, and also reduce vehicle emissions I remember that Councillor Ross talked about this at one of the council meetings. I haven't actually looked into the literature on this, but it makes sense that if you don't have traffic queued up and sitting there waiting, that you're gonna have lower emissions. Um, and you can also reduce the electricity consumption by eliminating the signal devices and then the maintenance related to the signals. Um, so, so this last piece, you know, in terms of with, if you don't have signals, the vehicles can travel through the intersection constantly. Um, and so this is where the challenge is and what Marcus was bringing up about that this does present a challenge for some pedestrians, um, particularly those who are blind, visually impaired, but especially blind. Um, and listening in on the DAC meeting last week, and I've heard this from DAC members before, including Myra, who's come to our meetings, is that, I mean, in terms of when somebody who is blind is trying to cross an intersection, the key thing for them is to listen to the difference between when there is traffic and when there isn't traffic. And if there's always traffic, they don't have those cues. Like there's never a hundred percent safe time. This is where the, some of the intersections downtown, which have which block all the vehicle traffic at one time and let everybody cross for pedestrians is really safe from a blind pedestrian perspective. Um, and so, I mean, there's quite a bit of literature about um, and design standards. Um, I know Mass DOT has in their design standards for roundabouts, they have suggestions about how to make it safer for pedestrians, including some um, pedestrian activated signals and things like that. But at the same time, unless all the traffic in the roundabout is stopped, like you're never gonna have 
traffic on and traffic off signal, like parts of the phases of the signal. So, um, so I remember, I think at the DAC meeting last week, they were discussing and they might've even voted that they said that they would prefer not to have a roundabout, that they would prefer an enhanced signal instead. Um, and then this is just the slide, just because I've gotten emails about this and I've heard discussions, I think on the um, Engage Amherst site, people keep talking about the, the, this intersection as it could be a rotary. And there are a lot of rotaries in Massachusetts. If you read like the Mass DOT information too, like there's a lot of confusion about what's a rotary, what's a roundabout. And so it seems like a primer, but it comes up a lot and maybe it will even come up at the public forum. I know it came up at the district five meeting where a number of the attendees were saying, it sounds like, like I don't want a rotary here. So um, I don't know, Marcus, do you have any questions? Give your hand. I see, oh, uh, Chris, Chris. Chris and Marcus, they have their hands Mark, yeah. up. So my question was if Tracy would send me her slides, because I'm putting together <laughs> a slideshow for um, next Thursday and Saturday, and your oh. thoughts are would be helpful to me. Oh, all right. Well, they're, my slides are mainly your slides, but OK. But the ones were, that have your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, OK, sure. <laughs> I can do that. Thank you. Marcus. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Um, so so I, I may have missed the conversation, but I had to step away for a second. But um, for the, you know, making a roundabout more pedestrian friendly, I mean, there's certainly options there. Um, of course. You know, using the Belisha beacons, oral alarms, that sort of stuff. Because that's why I'm curious about just how many other intersections or even crosswalks in town have sufficient, you know, up to a certain standard of uh, awareness. You know, yes, sure, the center of the very, very center of town has that. Um, but none of the crosswalks around it do necessarily, you know, the only real Belisha beacon use is, you know, on the college campus and that sort of I, stuff so yes guilford would know right so Gil, I, guilford are the only two ones with the sound activated are the two like ones on like north pleasant and south pleasant downtown are there others so, so when we started should i go yeah go ahead guilford oh sorry um, so we started out putting those um, on every intersection in town that had a crosswalk. Um, and as time went on, we started pulling them off crosswalks, mainly because the neighbors who live next to the crosswalk didn't like them. And the, the, the continuous beeping and the continuous talking uh, of the device made people say, so take them out. Um, so they were taken out of almost everything. Um, they're back in the center of town. The one at Route 9 um, and Route 9 and, and South Pleasant Street is there, but it stopped working. The one at Kellogg and North Pleasant stopped working. The new one, there is a new one in North Amherst at Pine Street. And it may be turned down way turned down because we got complaints about it making too much noise as well. So we, we've used them in other places. Um, and usually what happens is if there's any, if there's anybody who is living or residing close to them, they, um, they have problems and they complain about the noise at certain times of the evening. And that's curious. So are we getting complaints about them not being there either? Yes, people, people will come back and say, hey, it's not working. And we'll say, well, we turned it down or we get complaints at night. Um, what, what's happening, and they're, they're evolving like everything else. And pretty soon there'll probably be one that comes out that actually you can program to work at certain times. Um, and, and that'll be more of what we kind of do. Yeah. Uh, Bernie. Yeah, um, I, I was surprised. There are a couple of civil engineers at UMass who've done some Mm -hmm. research in on this um 
and, and uh, uh, I sort of stumbled across one of their their papers earlier today. But the, the in terms of um, the location of crosswalks is going to be an issue here, not only for folks who are visually impaired, but also for traffic patterns and you know people getting in and out of those businesses. So th that needs to be the consideration needs to be given for both those things. Um, I also have come across some compromises on this to put like an on-demand signal um, on a crosswalk so that when someone who's visually impaired or someone who is has some mobility difficulties and needs some you need some assurances that cars are stopped, they could trigger the thing, not unlike the lights that we see along Amherst College with to assist in crossing. Yeah. So you've got that option. Um, the other thing is, is in terms of a signaled intersection, a signal intersection with a right turn lane or right on red can be um, pretty hazardous for folks who are visually impaired as well. So uh, there, there are probably some engineering fixes to, to make people feel more, more confident. But um, the bottom line is for folks who are visually input, impaired, <clears throat> um, regardless of what happens at the intersection, there's gonna have to be some ability to train people mm -hmm. to the way things are now laid, the new layout and how to use it. Um, so that, that's my, my two cents on all this. Mm. Thank you. So, so Chris, is your hand up a second time? I, I don't, or do I have to put them down? I forget how that works. <laughs> My hand is not up. Okay, it's down now. Okay, uh, Tracy. No, it was. Hey, it, well, is Marcus's hand still up, or is it down now? Too. Okay. It's down now. It's, um. Right. So I think to Bernie's point is that. Um, I mean, again, there can be accommodations made for visually impaired people at the intersections, including having activated pedestrian activated signals, audio flashing lights and so on. One challenge can be if for pedestrian safety reasons, if you move the crosswalks out of the center of the roundabout, but then if you're visually impaired or blind, you're not necessarily sure where the crosswalks are located. And you can do training. Um, one thing that's been said um, at the DAC meetings is that like there was somebody who spoke at the last one and who does travel training for people who are blind and visually impaired to help them navigate. And that he never recommends that people go through a roundabout as a blind or visually impaired person. And that when he trains people, he trains them to like, even if they have to go like a block out of their way to go at like a crossing intersection that's safer in his mind. Um, so. So that, that yeah. Oh. yeah, Gilford. Oh, you've got to push the demute button. He, he actually says an uncontrolled intersection is safer. So it's a lot of overcome there. I don't know um, about that, but. So the, uh, so the, I mean, it's an interesting, an interesting. Uh, I, I would I would observe yeah. that well, this is suggesting that the intersection design uh, goes beyond round or square. Um, it might go in, to include for pedestrian for the pedestrian safety part of it, um, uh, developing of not at this intersection but away a little bit safe crossings yeah and i think that i mean i would be curious to um understand from the guy what kind of roundabout he was referring to because there are so many different types yeah. we have no idea where the pedestrian crossing was i mean it could have been straight across the middle for all we know that he's referring to so he says that don't go there i mean just yes. a crosswalk we're getting better up at cushman you know with the with the um lighted signs like that just putting those is a hell of a lot better than uh, anything like that you know any right. uncontrolled yeah. part so yeah then those are mid-block crossings on pine street you mean those no pine well yeah up like bridge street pine street wherever it is yeah. eve i wanted to hear the rest of the slideshow oh, oh. <laughs> tracy 
<laughs> I just had I just had three more slides. I mean, it was really just for our conversation. Yeah, we saw that. But it was a bit of a sidetrack, um, which I thought was yeah, good. All right. So anyway, let's just remember rotaries are not roundabouts. Roundabouts are not rotaries. Right. Um, and um, and I haven't corrected the person who wrote that in the NG, Engage Amherst site, but maybe somebody could. <laughs> Uh, okay, so just there were just I just had a few examples. I mean, there's tons of examples about um, rotaries, including that have been created to improve village centers and to improve pedestrian access. Um, so here's one that was done in New York. You know, New York State has done a lot of roundabouts, including like groups of roundabouts. Um, so this one was done. It was completed last year. And so one of the things they do is that they do have <clears throat> The rectangular rapid flashing beacons, which are similar to the ones that are now on Route 9 in Hadley, like in the center of Hadley. Um, and so, you know, they found that it greatly enhanced pedestrian access and safety <coughs> by having those connections. Um, so, I mean, there have been some roundabouts that have been around for a long time. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, so, Kittleson, there. Kittleson, which are consultants, they're the ones who put together the mass DOT guide and planning design guidelines for roundabouts. Um, and they have on their website, they have an extensive database of all the roundabouts that they are aware of in the country. And you can also, you can um, search it for different adjacent land uses as well as for ones that have um, signal enhancements or like rapid flashing beacons or other types of things. <coughs> Excuse me, that part of the database um, doesn't seem to be very complete, but there's over 7,000 databases. I mean, about in their database. Uh, sorry, so this was, um, this was the first urban roundabout in New York State it's about uh, 12 years, 13 years old now. It's a very small community. It's main. It's got a large number of um, elderly people. And so this roundabout inc um, replaced a stop controlled intersection. So it wasn't a signal. Um, and they did um, similar to what happened at the Clifton Park one. I mean, they did inc have quite a bit of signage for pedestrian safety, including having the speed awareness devices to make people aware of how fast they're going and what the speed limit is. And they had the automatic light flashing lights activation on the sidewalk ramps. And, uh, and they found that, you know, everybody it made people feel a lot safer in general there. Um, and this is one. So, you know, this is a one back a couple decades ago from Florida. And um, it was on a waterfront and it had been a signalized intersection, they replaced it. And, you know, it really increased a lot of the pedestrian traffic. And one of the things that they were looking to do is that because it was near the waterfront, they wanted to really slow the traffic down to about 10 miles per hour. So what they did is they created curb extensions, just like other types of traffic calming features that they put in the roundabout to make it narrow and to make all the cars slow down a lot. Um, as well as the median islands and so on. So that was my quick little summary. So, I mean, going back to the kind of the key issues, right? So these were the issues that were identified in the staff slides, um, which are the key issues I think that we're probably interested in predominantly. And as, you know, as the slides talk about that both enhanced a, say, signalized intersections and roundabouts can address those. I mean, a lot of it really just has to in my mind, it has to do more with the design about like how things are being implemented and where things are being placed and how the intersections are actually functioning. So. And yeah. I, I guess I would take for granted that it's a good design, whether whether it's a roundabout or a, a intersection. Um, it wouldn't be, for instance, dumb signals. Um, it wouldn't be um, a rotary by mistake instead of a roundabout um, or anything like that. But at the uh, same, but at the same time, I think that um, there can be design elements that some people think will work well, and then like post intersection, they're not working the way that was anticipated. Yeah. I mean, so 
in the last, I don't know, two sessions ago, this roundabout class I'm taking, they focus on the public participation. And, and one of the key elements is that, you know, even after you design it and after you build it, you still need to get public participation about how it's working. And I think that was one of the questions that came up too about the Triangle Street intersection, right? Because some of the concerns that were raised there, they said, well, after the intersection's built, we'll reevaluate like how it's working. And so maybe that, maybe there would be a good time to do that, so. Um, so I, I, I took out of that and uh, <laughs> off of recollections of our past conversations, nine things that, um, maybe eight that um, might be issues that uh, need to be considered um, when comparing the two, uh, when you're weighing the two options, which is to say a well-designed uh, rotary and a well-designed, uh, well-designed -designed roundabout. I got me started. No, I got me started. Well-designed roundabout and a, a well-designed smart signalized intersection. Um, <clears throat> pedestrian access. Um, uh, and I, I just, my abbreviation is loss of LOS, loss of service, but just try handling the volume that goes through it. And that's includes maybe in particular, um, you know, rush hours where um, stacking traffic is not a good thing. Um, and it's related to the third thing I have here, which is emissions and, and just environmental considerations. Uh, fourth, uh, speed and crash safety. Um, and five, I, I separated it from um, the pedestrian um, because it, it keeps coming up as a separate in, uh, issue is accessibility for mobile impaired and visually impaired. Uh, one, I think this is for Guilford, maintenance, maintainability of this thing. Uh, when he says that um, we had so many more chirping intersections and many of them are broken now, um, I, th I think that might be something that, that is an issue we should consider. Um, I added from- uh, if, you're gonna, yeah, if you're gonna do, do maintenance, don't do the chirping part. Do the part about the a signalized intersection relies on power. So when the power goes out, the intersection stops. Okay. And the poles often get hit by vehicles. And then that's, uh, those are expensive poles to replace. So. Um, from that standpoint, maintenance is more about maintaining the light to make sure it works and then keeping the power to it when power goes out. Uh, I'll make it maintenance slash reliability then. <laughs> um, then uh, then as, a, as a sort of an outgrowth from uh, some comments that were made at the, uh, at the precinct five meeting, um, aesthetic. Now, I don't know how to define that but um, I know that's going to come up. And um, I, I, you know, just even if we put it on our list as things to consider and don't have any way of considering it, I think it's, it's important that, that that is kept in the conversation. Um, experience, local experience as an issue, how that might affect uh, the decision. Um, Anything else? I'm sure there are others. I just admit that because I know I haven't thought of them. Bruce, then a question for Tracy. Uh, are there any roundabouts that have raised crosswalks or uh, as, as you head up to the crosswalk, the pavement might be a different sort of pavement so that somebody walking who is visually impaired could feel the difference and know that's where they're supposed to cross? Yeah, so I think, I mean, in terms of design guidelines that I've seen for assisting visually impaired people in crossing at these intersections, as well as other intersections, is that it's always helpful to have a differentiated pavement, um, as long as it's the kind that you can maintain in, in a New England winter that's not going to get all, like, uneven over time. Um, like so, bricks and granite. Yeah, I mean, you could do it at the crossing itself or even just like on the edge of the roadway to indicate it. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Eve. 
So just a background question before I have a couple of comments, but background question. So were there um, sort of rough designs or uh, I, I keep thinking that what's really needed for the sense of place question is kind of an on the ground sketch of what the two would look like. Has, has, do we have anything like that at this point? Yeah, Guilford, Chris. We have sketches of what? An on the ground view uh, of what the, each each option would look like. No, just what's in the slideshow. That's all we have right now, and that's just a rough concept. It's not not the exact not the exact plan. All right. So then I'm going to add one. So my three comments are one that I I really think that that's essential for people to be, be able to make a good decision. Um, second comment is, uh, I really appreciated your comment, Tracy, about that, like no absolute stop of traffic ever. Um, and your comment about, was it Bernie's comment about right, or Marcus's comment about the right turn on red can make that also true in, in signalized intersections. But I remember um, after the triangle roundabout went in, I. I don't know why, but I often would do a mid-block crossing with my bike on um, East Pleasant, just north of that triangle roundabout. And I suddenly realized like a mid-block crossing is, is really difficult all of a sudden when there's just no stop in traffic. So like um, just that loss of a red light affects not only that intersection, but um, you know a block or two away as well in terms of the flow of traffic. And then well, it seems a, like I had a pretty net by now. Yeah, I guess that that's an interesting. Uh, uh, so maybe I'm going to add on onto the list here, number nine as um, near intersection impact, or something along those lines. All right. When we did our walk, um, our neighborhood of this area, um, you know, one of the, uh, the guy who was part of the subcommittee who was a PBTA bus driver, he really talked a lot about how this intersection was just impossible for um, bus riders, but I'm assuming that both designs would account for safety of bus riders. Yeah, the, the triangle has some weird with the, with the bus, yeah. Kim? Yeah, it's interesting, um, Tracy, what struck me about your presentation is a, you know, one, I, ha I think, I, I mean, I've gone through that intersection quite a bit on my um, bike, car, and um, running. And uh, other than running through the intersection, I can safely say that I have never seen anyone crossing there. And that might just be because of the time of day I go. I think it's a really barren intersection as far as like, pedestrian traffic. I mean, hardly anyone's on those sidewalks. I certainly see people waiting at the buses, which, you know, on the, the bus, um, inter the, the bus stops there. I certainly have seen people waiting. Um, so what struck me really a lot about your presentation is, um, you know, the idea that, that we could, and th that roundabouts would s slow down all traffic, right? Um, approaching that intersection because I know that I like to go, I, I head to Holyoke, you know, to bring my kid to ballet in the evenings and I like to zoom right through there. Um, and certainly a roundabout would slow everybody down and make everyone a little more aware. And, and I, I, I really feel like by that slowing down of everyone's traffic, you know, then everyone has to pay attention at that intersection. And then perhaps it's easier as a pedestrian to cross if the crosswalks are set back a little bit. I mean, I, I, th that, you know, the, the fact that you talked about the, the, um, what, you know, that it actually might have increased pedestrian traffic through that intersection is really striking to me because I think that intersection could really use more pedestrian. I mean, there are lots of people in those neighborhoods, but I feel like they never cross the road. Um, so, um, I like those two examples that you gave and like the explanation of the um, of the communities that were surrounding it. And it would be great if there were more of those so we could like really see, does it do roundabouts, you know, increase pedestrian traffic in places like that? Because I get, I bet they would. Um, so thank you for that. That was really useful. And I think it's really helpful in further um, um, presentations to include information just like that. 
because I think it might change some people in the community who are thinking about about roundabouts. It might change, you know, it might start them thinking roundabouts aren't so bad. <laughs> that, that gets to Marcus's comment about getting data about how things are working, actually working in town. So a bunch of hands. I'm going to start with Bruce. I would like to agree with Kim. I, I, as a pedestrian, if I'm walking somewhere, even if there is a, a, a button to press to do a red light to cross, if, if traffic is barreling along on a highway, it just isn't pedestrian friendly, even, even with a, a activated signal. Whereas I, I agree, if, if there is a roundabout, the traffic will all have to slow down, which to me would, would help give more of a sense of a village center rather than traffic is going at 50 miles an hour. And once in a while, when somebody dares to press the button, it slows down or stops. But how, how appealing is that village center going to be if traffic is barreling along? Yeah. Eve was one of the hands. No, okay, I thought I saw that. Um, so that, that's, uh, I guess it's an interesting irony that um, the traffic goes slower through uh, roundabouts. Um, and, and yet the average time it takes for a vehicle to get through the intersection when it's a roundabout is lower than uh, when it's signalized, which is one of the cool things. Tracy. So one issue that can come up in terms of the intersection queuing that you'll see in the literature, if you look, is that if you do have more stops, um, if you do have more, you know, pedestrian cr activated crossings that stop the traffic and so on, that it can then increase the queuing as well, right? So part of the roundabout is designed so that to eliminate that, to eliminate the emissions and everybody waiting. Um, but there are some sweet spots with it, um, you know, in different ways you can design it so that that doesn't become an issue. But if it's not designed with that in mind, it could potentially become an issue again, particularly as it approaches capacity for the flow. Uh, but I mean, that that's kind of assuming that there's a level of traffic, a level of pedestrian traffic where that would be an issue, right? I mean, to Kim's point, well, the only time I've ever gone there and crossed the road was trying to get from Mission to, um, to the Moan and Dove so I could bring yeah, my food back to Moan and Dove. <laughs> But well, I mean, but... that's really pretty much about all it is. Uh, I, I could see an increase with the town's purchase of the golf course. You know, when we get that up and running, people from around the community walking across there to go for walks and stuff like that. But it's still not going to be a major um, pedestrian thoroughfare. My one concern, though, you know, when you get into roundabouts is... Um, just depending on how much traffic is going to turn le left or right so that because that that will also build up your queues uh, um, entering roundabouts if they're not able to actually um, get onto the roundabout because the traffic because of the traffic on the roundabout that is going across them so you can run into that issue and that can send, then lead to signalized roundabouts and stuff like that but I, one, I do have one question though on your presentation, Tracy. I, I don't know if you, I'm sure you, it, in there it said, you know, there's uh, queuing in the evening for rush hour, but there was no mention of any queuing in the morning. Is there a particular reason for that? Maybe that's a Guilford question. Um, well, so that's from the town slides and I, I believe yeah, right. that, but the general patterns with commuting hours is that um, people go to work at all different kind times of day, you know, like some will go to work at like seven or eight or nine or especially around around this area, right? You have people at the university who go to work much later and earlier shifts. And so, um, but typically like people, the evening commute is much more compressed. Like the okay. majority yeah. of people will leave work between say like four and six or something. Mm -hmm. or even like five and six, whereas in the morning, it's just way more spread out. Um, yeah. I think we've seen that in, in studies that, that we've seen in the past. So. Uh, Chris, you've been very patient. Hi, so I wanted to follow up on two things. One is that people have been saying that they don't see much pedestrian traffic in this intersection when they go through there. And my understanding is that there's a lot of pedestrian traffic in the daytime 
because there's an office park, the Amherst office park is on the west side of, of West Street and there are places to get food on the east side. There's the, what is it? The Speedway, you know, little market there. There's, um, yeah. I think there's Zhang's Kitchen, there's El Comolito, there's, you know, a bunch of places to get food on the east side. So there's a lot of crossing in the middle of the day. So maybe that's why you haven't seen pedestrian traffic. The other thing I wanted to mention was that um, if we do choose to have a roundabout, um, we may also be including um, some kind of um, pedestrian activated signals. And so the issue of um, having to maintain uh, signals and also whether signals might get hit by cars or not could also be a problem with a roundabout. So I just wanted to mention that, that's all. Yeah, but pedestrian signals don't, when they fail, the, the intersection doesn't fail. Uh, most of it doesn't fail. So, Bernie, uh, I'll see. I got you, Eve. Uh, yeah, I was just going to suggest to Marcus that if he got his food at El Camolito, he could get the Mona Dove without crossing any streets. <laughs> one, of the, one, of the, one of the things about this particular area is it, the businesses down there, the shops down there, get a lot of traffic later in the day from folks that live in Amherst Woods and along Station Road and uh, in, in even parts of, of Belchertown, those folks take different routes when they commute to and from work, but they shop a lot down there. And the, uh, that, that got demonstrated when the, uh, when the bridge was out. Uh, those the little businesses down in that, that section really suffered um, because they, they got cut off. So there would be a differential between morning traffic and afternoon traffic. I don't live far from there. I've not been down through there that much during the day, but there is the office park. Uh, there are apartments there. Um, I would suspect that there'd be more foot traffic midday. So, uh, I, and also one of the, the important things, and I, I maybe, maybe that goes on the list, is that uh, today there is an amount of foot traffic. Tomorrow, uh, we're hoping, we're expecting that there'll be more as that, as that town center, that village center begins to develop. And so, you know, we do need to think about you know, people that are not there yet, um, among other things. So, Eve. Yeah, that was exactly what I was going to ask. Um, <laughs> you know, Chris, do, what's the vision of what's the potential for future um, bike, pedestrian, and um, transit traffic through that intersection? Yeah, and I, I guess maybe to, to draw that point out a little bit more, too, um, I was... Uh, impressed when we were doing our work on the, uh, the North Amherst intersection at um, how much traffic in 20 years has changed. And, you know, the, the life of this intersection is going to be certainly 20 years. And um, I, I don't know how good the predictions were 20 years ago, pre-COVID, but um, uh, I, I certainly would want to think about them going forward. Um, so I, I just, just by the way, I, I've, I've taken the decision to, to let this go on and, and set aside uh, our marking up exercise, just because this is going very well. Um, um, you know, I'm going to add that future, future proofing. No, I'm not going to say future proofing because I hate that. Look, having the, those kinds of things must have um those kinds of studies must have been done on this intersection, no? I don't know. Because, um, yeah, we certainly got those in that, that HOT intersection. That was a big... Right. That, yeah, that was a big... Um, well, so... Roundabout versus... And, and our, our support of a roundabout versus a signal. I imagine that a part of our recommendation might be um, what studies, what, what research would need to be done to, to get to the right answer. And, and uh, certainly a traffic survey. I'm sure they're all, that Gilbert is already figuring out how to get that done and what it would be. Um, <coughs> but uh, that, that would be one. Uh, I don't know, um, you know if, if, if there's a reasonable way to extrapolate that into the future. Um, that, that, that will be done. Yeah. And what are we going to find there, you imagine? <laughs> Lots 
Lots and lots of traffic. I mean, how many tens of thousands of trips in a day go through there? You, it's actually, it's, it's dropped off quite a bit. So what you'll probably find is that the traffic will be about what it was pre-COVID in about another 10 years, five to 10 years. Oh, oh my. Is that long, um, you think? Uh, huh? Tracy. Know, we'll see. Um, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, some of the land uses in that area, like you have the school, the Montessori school, and you have the, like the gymnastics place and things like that. I mean, those are uses that don't have traffic now. I mean, I would be, I think I had brought up earlier that at an earlier meeting that I'd be hesitant, like if we base some of some of the future conditions in terms of the traffic volume based on what it is like with COVID. Well, um, but now the restaurants don't even have, right? Those are big draws, the restaurants and, you know, and right. again, reasons, nothing because there aren't as many cars right now. No. Um, so one thing too, I was thinking about, and I've seen in some of the comments as people talk about this intersection is also for students who are walking from Crocker Farm or from um, East Hadley Road. So how much, I mean, it's a, it's like a mile and I don't know, maybe a, between a mile to two miles distance. But um, I was wondering how much, like, is that, I mean, students who live that far away from Crocker, they do take the bus, right? They're not walking, I don't think. Yeah. yeah. Is that right? I mean, East I Hadley Road students, East Hadley mile. Road, well, it depends on the age of the students, yeah. um, but, but even East Hadley Road students are typically taking the bus. Um, but just in terms of like, if there was to be a roundabout there and there was gonna be more development just along that section of 116 between that intersection and coming into town, like making it more villagey because right, we're talking about like the improvements at Groff Park and like the Shea Streets intersection. And so if yeah. you were, I mean, it could be, if you do have a roundabout there it could send a message that it's like the beginning of like kind of a village corridor type thing. Like you're entering a more developed area and that you should be slower accordingly. And there could be other additional traffic calming along that corridor at some of the other intersections. Yeah, I, we are also got to deal with the, um, the road crossing over at not Pomeroy. We were talking about it a while back with the bus stop. At, at Potwine. Potwine, so it's all kind of gonna right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, my my crystal ball shows that there's a wetland to the north, and so the, maybe the maybe the development won't go that way much, but certainly south and east and west, there's there's room, and well, and and activity. So Kim, to your point, I mean that wetland right now, you know everything narrows right there, and it's not going. You know we're not going right. to get extensive sidewalks or you know that road is not going to widen through that. Um, through, through that wetland that's just north of that intersection. Well, and isn't that where the sidewalk is closed right now? The one on yeah. to the south, yeah. right? Yeah. What's Guilford, what's the time frame on fixing that? Oh, it's in the works. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, like out, three months, six months, nine months, <laughs> three years. <laughs> um, no, I imagine by the end of the summer, it should yeah. definitely be back in place, if not a little sooner. Oh, good. So I, I'm going to note that that on the map that we're not going to work on tonight, um, that this was going to be a purple line that came down over ah. that narrow place in the road, none e even so. so. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Which will keep oh. well, at least through that part, it will keep the the traffic at a minimum. You know, right there to, to your yeah. point, Tracy, which is just north of that, and and to your point of like just slowing everything down because something's going to have, have to happen at the Graf Park intersection as well. Like that's going to happen. Well, but also like, I know at one of the meetings, I think man in the district five meetings like people talked about it, like having signage and things like about it, you know, directional signs, like go see different parts of town, but also just sort of sending a message is like you've entered a village and that kind of thing. And um, so, I mean, Kim, you had asked about other intersections where, you know, where there are roundabouts. And as I said, that Kittleson database has, a, you know, thousands of them. I mean, some of them are obviously more pedestrian friendly than others. I had just picked a couple, um, but, but like two of them I took out of this one 
case study book that's got like lots and lots of examples. So I, I just um, think it's really I mean, powerful in the sense that it might get, you know, like to me, the demographic um, information that you said mm -hmm. for those communities was like 30%, you know, over 65 or something, which right. means, you know, people who, who perhaps want to go slower through intersections or, sure. or maybe just want to enjoy their surroundings a little more. And that kind of, that might strike more of a chord with, with people. Mm -hmm. kind of I mean, yeah. What, I mean, we must be above that though, right? Above 35% in terms of over 65, especially down that end of the <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know, actually, Marcus. I don't know the the um, the apartments back there have have young true. families. Yeah. yeah. Um, so well, also south of that intersection, right there is a big bank of of um, of like condos or something there too. Yeah. Yeah. And right. we know from our our the talk about the pot wine intersection that there are, there are lots of young families a little bit further to the south as well. So. But well, also those people have the same concerns, right? If you're with yep. small children or yep. mm -hmm. you're just learning to ride their bikes, everyone wants to go through the section yeah. intersection in a safe way. So, Bernie, nope, I see the hand up. Well, I didn't because that's because I didn't take it down. Oh, so. I see. Okay, it doesn't go down. You know, that. did you see that there's two Bernies? Yeah, yeah, there that's, is. that's his twin brother. Right. Um, <laughs> so um, there's two errands too, but that's... there's two errands, yeah. That's, 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 and the cat, <laughs> what do you suppose he wants? Um, the, the so cat wants I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm planning on going to the TSO discussion next week on this. And um, is it okay if I sort of take a sense of so we don't since we haven't put anything together, and what I'm going to offer. Um, uh, to, to Kim for next week, for ne next meeting is uh, by my notes with the 10 considerations that we're considering or think should be considered in taking this decision so that we can work on that formally. But otherwise, is it right if I go and just, just uh, offer a synopsis of, of this discussion, which, which I, I would point out um, is leaning heavily to a roundabout um, with the, that is designed correctly and has some other accoutrements to provide for everybody who might be using it. Yeah. Great. I, I, yeah, because I, I do think it's important that we have some kind of um, voice there, you know? Yeah. Our, our I, I mean, I, I guess I'm not really, I mean, there are, I mean, as I showed right there can be positive attributes of roundabout. I don't feel really tied to a roundabout design. I do feel like a good um, no, enhanced no, signalized no. intersection, particularly with the turn lanes, because that's like where you get the most backups of traffic. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I would like to, if we, if there is a signalized intersection there, maybe there can be additional traffic calming put in like such as like um, like drawing the curbs in and things like that to like narrow the road just to also speed the traffic down in the same way. Similar to- I'll leave it as a slight lead towards, towards roundabout. I, just, I mean, the concerns for the um, visually impaired pedestrians, it does concern me a lot, so. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, that's and, and not only because of the effects on visually impaired pedestrians, but that it's a common problem for any pedestrian. Um, especially when there's mobile impairment or, and anything like that. Um, all right, so good, thank you. Um, I uh, before before I invite Bruce to make his motion, I just wanted to say that um, I can't come to the meeting in two weeks. Um, I'm going to get a new knee, and I expect that I may not be entirely coherent um, having having got that brand new knee that day. Um, so. Um, and we we we, uh, we elected Kim to uh, to uh, stand in my place when these things happened. Um, so um, I'm going to. Um, she doesn't know this yet. She knew that, but she doesn't know this. That I'm going to um, offer that um, she she handle the weekly phone call to put together the agenda as well. Um, 
I mean, there's, there's some big decisions to take and some some complicated things. Um, but I, I like to touch bases with with Guilford. Um, you know, late late next week, um, so that um, Amber can get everything pulled together. Um, I just have a quick comment. Do you want? Oh, to I'm do sorry, Bruce. I saw you. I did see you. Yes, Bruce. Do you want to do the minutes quickly? Um, sure. Well, just if there's not if there's not further discussion on that, if Kim is okay with that. May um, I just ask if Marcus is okay? Because I see he has a bandage on his head. Well, that's why I was gonna I was gonna make Aaron feel bad about just having his knee replaced. I've got a new head. <laughs> it so didn't work. I'm still here. <laughs> I'm sorry. It didn't Marcus. work. You're okay. <laughs> I'm fine. I had a, a skin graft last week. Last week. Sometime last week. Oh. And stuff. Right. Yeah. Speedy yeah. recovery to you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Speedy recovery, Marcus. And, and a yeah. speedy recovery to you, Aaron. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, you know, in a, in a way, I'm looking forward to it. Um, just just dragging this thing around has been been a big deal lately, more lately. So, um, so minutes. Um, did did everybody or many of us get a chance to read them? There are two. Let me go back a month. Tracy. I, I would make a request that we don't receive the minutes like just a few hours before the meeting. I just don't always have time to look at them. And yeah. so, I mean, I know that Amber's minutes are great um, and she does a great job. I well, just, I, I'm, I'm happy to take that as a suggestion that, that we yeah, postpone we using these minutes our, until next time. We can put it on our agenda for next I mean, time. Let's do that. I it's fine. That way. But, but Guilford, you've, you've still got to tell Amber how much we appreciate her getting we up. Love, even though she gets them to us at that moment, it's uh, there. It's, I'm super impressed and, and very appreciative. Uh, yes, Tracy, you want to finish that? And I saw you. Oh, for the minutes, yes. It's I know that there's some committees that still don't have somebody taking minutes for them. And as somebody who used to take the minutes for the public transportation and bike committee, I am grateful whenever anybody else takes minutes. I, I echo Always. that. <laughs> yes, having, having been a secretary for a meeting, yes, I, I appreciate that too. Eve. I just wanted to make the practice suggestion that we used to do in TAC, which was um, just give a couple minutes for people to look at the minutes, you know, because a lot of people don't always get to it ahead of a meeting. And if you just make yeah. the make a five minute window to look at and think about the minutes rather than a one minute window, then it is just, it works. Yeah. Anyway, just a thought. Okay. No, we, 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 we always run over even if we don't spend time reading. So uh, <laughs> Tracy? So I just have a quick question about, so um, uh, Chris had mentioned that TSO will be discussing the Pomeroy intersection on the 8th and the 22nd of April. So our next meeting is on April 1st and Aaron, you won't be here. Um, so I'm assuming that we'd wanna provide some written comments to the TSO before their discussion on the 8th. And I just wanted to just check with people about the logistics of how we thought we would do that. So what I will offer um, is, are, are, are my notes with the, the 10 bullets that tonight um, that, that you could take as a, as a starting point to put something together next time? But just just as a frame to, to to you know frame the comments, okay. um, and let that let that be the big task for for next time. Darn, I'm going to be missing it. Well, and oh. we I mean, sorry, we could also circulate something after the meeting for comment and just you know be aware of the open meeting law requirements, yeah. like where we're not commenting in real time. But that would still be a chance. Well, so to, let me send this directly maybe tomorrow and um, I'll, I'll let let comments uh, flow back to Kim if okay. that's okay I mean I'm increasing your workload now Kim I, 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 I'm noticing this um, so that um, that can be pulled together for the next meeting that, that's that's a good idea yeah let's do that and I will offer to help Kim if Thank she you. wants help okay. sure yep 
Thank you. Yeah, two, two doesn't count. Good. That's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bruce. I move that we adjourn. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll we'll see you. you in a month. Yes. Good luck, Aaron. And I'll be right, good luck, Aaron. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Good luck, Aaron. Bye. Thank you.